Broadcasting from the Unshackled Studios in Melbourne, this is Wilms Front, brought to you by theunshackled.net. Now here's Tim Wilms. Australia is continuing to see active coronavirus cases uh, decrease, which is fantastic. Uh, attention is now rightly on lifting social restrictions and tearing down state borders as quickly as possible to kickstart our economic recovery from lockdown. Uh, Prime Minister Scott Morrison in his National Press Club address yesterday outlined a transition away from the job keeper and job seeker welfare programs, proposing a new job maker program to equip Australians in learning the skills needed with the jobs to rebuild Australia. Now, certainly the perfect time to correct policy and economic settings that to date have held, held Australia back. A man on the, the government benches who uh, has already uh, proposed plenty of great ideas to get Australia back on the right track is the member for Hughes from Southwestern Sydney, uh, Craig Kelly MP, who joins me uh, from his electorate office. Uh, uh, Craig Kelly MP, thanks for joining me. Yeah, no, good to be with you, Tim. Now, firstly, how has the life of an MP changed during the coronavirus pandemic? Traditionally, MPs are very hands-on uh, in the community, attending all manner of local events and ceremonies, which haven't been able to take place during uh, social distancing. Well, I'll be honest, it's, we are probably one of the um, least professions that has that's been affected. Um, li probably a little bit less travel. Uh, we had a couple of parliamentary sittings in Canberra uh, cancelled. Um, a lot more meetings on Skype and Zoom and uh, you know YouTube and telephone conferences. Uh, a lot less travel. A lot more email correspondence. Um, a lot more telephone talking on the telephone than normal. And just a little bit less face to face, but um, as a, it's pretty much been other than that, it's pretty much been you know, work as normal. Uh, because you would have had a lot of inquiries uh, to uh, your office about uh, because, well, I've experienced it uh, firsthand where, where I live and, and interacting uh, with my viewers, the, the uncertainty uh, just about the, the coronavirus and what assistance is available, what's going to happen to businesses, uh, uh, that, uh, it, it, that's seen a lot of people contacting their uh, MPs and representatives uh, uh, to try and find out what's going on. A lot of inquiries, of course, about the uh, job keeper and um, job seeker schemes. People <coughs> asking about what the rules were. Would they qualify? Um, you know, initially when things were being closed down, uh, you know, there was a lot of real distress in the community. I had one guy you know, ring me and basically break down. He said, "You know, mate, I said, I'm going to have no money. You know, what am I going to do? I'm going to have no money. My, my business is closed. I can't work." He had like some sort of like takeaway food ban that went to um, you know, different events and you know football matches and things around the place. So now I've got no work. So I've, so I've just gone up the Woolworths trying to get a job stacking shelves. But he said, I don't get that one bad week. So those, um, you know, that was a, he was then able to qualify under the job keeper scheme, um, which without it, <clears throat> it would have been great, uh, really great social distress. So, it was a very good scheme. Look, it had a, a few hairs on it. Um, but when you're doing something with such speed, with such volume of, uh, you know, dollars you have to get out the door to so many people, um, you know, it was never, ever going to be right the first time. I think the, the Treasurer understood that and he put some building flexibility into the scheme. Uh, as I said in my introduction, uh, Scott Morrison in his National Press Club ad uh, address yesterday, uh, uh, or he, he didn't, out or he uh, proposed the, the next uh, stage be job maker and what well, could be called job skilling because in the past the, the short term solution to skill shortages uh, has simply been to import those skills using 457 visas, sort of kicking the can down the road, but obviously businesses can no longer import people. So now now's the time to invest in the real solution to, to skill uh, Australians and really have a, a retooling of uh, both higher and vocational education. Well, that's um, obviously very important, uh, but that's just one, you know, real small step in the, uh, you know, in what's required. Ultimately, you're only going to get those employment numbers down in the long term if you get people in the private sector uh, that are prepared to take a risk and have a go and risk their capital. 
and try and start up, you know, and expand their businesses. Um, that's ultimately, you know, the government can only do um, you know, so much. We can't employ everyone, uh, you know, in a government job. Uh, it's got to be those people out in the private sector that really got to be leading the way. And often we talk about you know, stimulus and, and, and spending or the, the history from the uh, Great Depression shows that that's not necessarily the best way to go about it. In fact, if you compare the, um, you know, the results of Australia uh, and the USA about how they got themselves out of the Great Depression, uh, it was Australia that went through a, a, a more policy of the, uh, I think they called it the Premier's <coughs> plan. But just look, we've got to get the budget uh, back on the balance. That's the most important thing. Uh, and we got our unemployment down much, much quicker than the USA that just kept on spending and spending and spending. Oh, I didn't mean uh, investment, uh, government uh, in investment. Of course, uh, it's it's still the, the the private sector. They're the ones who uh, create the jobs and also launch the uh, the businesses. And this is uh, obviously where the debate is is at at the moment. Lifting these uh, uh, social restrictions. Scott Morrison's got the the three step framework, but uh, it's up to the uh, the state premiers to uh, go along that uh, that three uh, step plan and there there's quite still a long way to go i know the the, the federal government people are learning a lot about our federation they can only do uh, so much when it comes to reopening the economy i've been very critical of the um, the state premiers um, i think this idea that we have to wait until things are safe right and the definition of uh, safety it, appears to change has changed over time but you know, if you wait for safety you're going to wait for never you know that means waiting for never and you can't continue to, to lock up like for example we've got you now the border between uh, new south wales and queensland you just can't continue to lock down the uh queensland tourism industry to, to um you know to interstate tourists in circumstances where in new south wales yesterday there were two detections of coronavirus out of a population of seven and a half million. Two people were detected, and both those people contracted the virus overseas. So of local local um, infections yesterday in New South Wales, uh, there was zero. Now the idea that you you know you've got to have that zero for four weeks in a row before you open up that border to Queensland, like, uh, it's just absurd. Because what I see these state premiers have really formed the trap for, they keep only looking at the effect of the coronavirus. And they say, we've got to get that coronavirus down to zero. And oh, yes, we've had six deaths from the coronavirus. And what they're not looking at or not at weighing up is what is the economic, social and health costs of lockdowns and having people, you know, we know from the from past, if you have an increase in unemployment, uh, you get a big increase in uh, adverse, worse, and of that. You get a big increase in self rates of self harm. So it's not as though, oh, look, we just keep everything locked up for the coronavirus and everything else will just, that'll just sort of bubble on in the background and won't harm. Every single hour these lockdowns go on, there's greater economic cost, there's greater social cost, and there's greater health cost. And it's got to be weighing up between both you've got to weigh up okay what are the what is actually these costs of locking things down and what are the benefits that we are obtaining from them as far as the coronavirus and weigh the two up and unless the benefits from locking down are greater you've got to open the things up you just can't continue to go on and, and the way we unlock things down it's completely unsustainable now what happens if in new south wales we continue to get them in victoria we continue to get the odd case all throughout winter. Does that mean the border with Queensland stays closed forever? And all those businesses and everyone that's invested, you know, and built up businesses and put their life savings into tourism-based business in Queensland, do they close down? Do they just all go drive them all into bankruptcy? Because their costs still continue, you know, while they're while they're um, locked down. So this is what's absolutely vital that. We get rid of much of these restrictions. Now, yes, you still have your, your social distancing. That's still all important. We've still got the, the bans on 
international travel, they'll be a while yet. But it's important we get rid of a lot of these restrictions that have no um, justification in health, get the place open, get the economy working again, and get people back into jobs. Well, the deal was uh, that, uh, how the public interpreted that uh, we need to have these uh, social restrictions and shutdowns so we can flatten the curve and so our ICU uh, wards uh, are not overwhelmed. They're not. They're, they're, there's about, I think, five five people in intensive care nationwide with the uh, coronavirus. We, we've, we've flattened the curve, uh, held up our end of the, the deal. And the, you're not going to... Uh, 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 get zero new infections there is going to be new cases here and there we've seen a few outbreaks but we've gotten on top of it and it's uh, this mission creep from flattening the curve to uh glad you use those words it's been mission creep you know remember we go back uh you know two months and the buzzword was flatten the curve flatten the curve that's what you've got to do because your hospital you don't flatten the curve, your hospitals won't be able to um, cope with that sort of spike that you'll have in infections. So you'll have the infections, the understanding of the infections, the number will be the same, but they'll be spread out over a longer period of time. Now, somewhere along that journey, the um, said there was mission creep, and it's sort of gone to an eradication policy, which was never, um, you know, contemplated when these lockdowns were put in place. I want to turn now to you're currently uh, publishing a 20-part series in the, the Spectator Australia entitled 20 Reasons Why the, the Wuhan Flu is the Final Nail in the, the Climate Alarmist uh, Coffin. You're, uh, you're up to uh, part eight at the moment, so there's still a lot to, to go. I, my, my interpretation is certainly the climate activists for a short while were upset that the, the pandemic had put a halt on their, their activism and policy agenda. But it seems they've quickly reinvented themselves as preventative health advocates, as they seem to be wanting us to be locked up forever as the, the best way to keep people healthy. And just by coincidence, uh, that will also halt the, the global uh, ec uh, capitalist economic uh, system. Their, their poster girl, uh, Greta Thunberg, she's now public health activist appearing on, on CNN as a ex uh, on their coronavirus expert panel. Well, yeah, look, it's uh, it's very interesting how there's been a, an alignment with, I would say, the um, the more extreme that you are or more alarmist that you are, you know, on climate change, the more pro you have been of locking everything down, you know, closing everything down and hiding under the bed. There's been a real alignment with uh, uh, those those two groups, which has been sort of, I think, quite a uh, quite an interesting outcome. But the the article in the Spectator, I, I, people often criticise us. Oh, you know, you can't call it the Wuhan flu. You shouldn't call it that. Well, no, well hang on. The Spanish flu was called the uh, the Spanish flu. Uh, we had the Hong Kong flu. We had the Asian flu. Um, you know, whether they were the original cases that these flus originated from, they were still named after a specific location. We have we have Ross River uh, fever. Uh, we have the Hendra virus uh, out of Queensland. So the idea that you simply can't um, court the Wuhan flu because you might upset the communist uh, Chinese somehow is absurd. And that's why I've sort of deliberately called it the, uh, the Wuhan flu uh, in those articles. And the argument has been that so many things that we are seeing from this Wuhan flu is actually a reason why a lot of climate alarmism uh, may be the end of it, but I think I might be a little bit... Uh, Premature. They're already the zombies are already jumping out of the out of the graves and uh, digging themselves up and wanting to get back on the field and fight. But what the next one in the series is an interesting one. It goes to the lockdowns that we've had. Now they've actually resulted in about I think it's about twenty percent decline at a, during different periods in actually CO two emissions. But that reduction in CO two emissions is not actually showing up in the uh, global CO2 measurements that are taken in the atmosphere. So where you would expect you have these big reductions uh, of CO2 emissions in man-made emissions, and remember, man-made emissions are only about three or 4% of the total emissions. So 
the vast majority of your emissions, 95% of more of CO2, come from natural sources. They come from the, the oceans and they come from vegetation, the soils and trees. And the atmosphere can't tell the difference if that CO2 molecule come from cement manufacturing or fossil fuel manufacturing or popping the uh, top off a, um, a bottle of champagne or whether it's natural from the oceans. So yet despite we've gone through all this pain and we've seen this big reduction in man-made CO2 emissions, it's not showing up in the measured, in, uh, measured levels of CO2 in the atmosphere. So I've had all this pain, all this hardship and CO2 levels in the atmosphere haven't moved. So it just shows the task that you want to, if you want to try and you know, sort of um, have some meaningful reduction in what uh, the CO2 emissions are or CO2 levels are, or CO2 levels was measured in the atmosphere actually are, you, we're going to have to go through, and this is just like a, a spin in the bucket as compared to the amount of pain and suffering that we've got to put a lot of people through. Uh, with this uh, economic shutdown, I think the the consensus among the the, the quiet Australians, as, as Scott Morrison has has coined them, they're going to say never again do we want to go through this this type of economic uh, turmoil. And uh, the uh, when uh, climate uh, activism began in the the early twenty first century, it was quite a prosperous time, and people they they tend they, when they're they're wealthy enough, they they tend to focus on these sorts of issues. But there's going to be a lot of re re uh, prioritizing now in a lot of people, and well, they haven't seen a cat a catastrophic consequences of of global warming in in the past twenty years, but they've seen the uh, the catastrophic effects of of economic shutdown, and uh, this is probably I, I know that uh, there's been a lot of talk uh, whether the the federal government will will help fund a, a coal fired power station. I know there's moves in New South Wales to potentially uh, look at uh, nuclear uh, energy. Now would certainly be the uh, the time when the the energy sector can uh, become reopened again and also these corporations that have been they hit hard uh there there might be uh, a rethinking of 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 woke capitalism now they're thinking about their bottom line rather than uh just their their pr marketing just a few points on that the reason why we haven't got a um, um the reason why we haven't had a really big increase or you know no one's built a coal fire power station not because it's not economical, or it's not because someone's not willing to build. Remember, there's hundreds of coal-fired power stations being built all around the world today. And these places are paying a premium to import Australian black coal, which we have basically at our doorstep. So they're paying a premium to import Australian black coal, and they still work out it's cheaper for them to build a coal-fired power station. Now, the only reason why it's not being built here in Australia is because of the political uncertainty. You need a, a you know a lifespan of a coal fire power station is going to be minimum thirty years, more likely fifty years. So, if you're an investor, you've got to get a return on this over thirty or fifty years. Now, you look down the track. Who knows what the next Labor government is going to look like? But we know the last you know only a little over twelve months ago, we could have had a Labor government elected that wanted a 45% economy-wide emissions target that now admits that that was a mistake. They could have been elected with that policy, which would have shut down, you know, which would have entered the decimation of anyone with a new coal-fired power station. So how can you actually invest over a 30-year period when who knows what type of, um, you know, mad extremist green left-wing government um, that you could get elected? You know, if we could have governments in 10 years' time that make the you know Victorian government look like the bastions of conservatism. Uh, so this is why the investment is not there, unless unless there's some sort of like you know government actually coming in and, and setting some parameters over those twenty years, so the investors know that they can get a return. As where all the investment we're seeing in the solar and wind field are all underwritten by the subsidies. 
I think we all shudder, uh, given that it's the oh, it's just past the one year anniversary of the the May eighteen federal election. Uh, what a how uh, a shortened Labor government would have handled the pandemic. It would have been Victoria Stan uh, on steroids, and I'm a, a Melbourneian uh, <laughs> myself, and. We only just got released from house arrest. Was it uh, just over over a week ago? We're waiting June the first for our uh, pubs, uh, cafes, and restaurants to to open. But we're, we've been on a, a bad uh, trajectory uh, in Victoria. That you'll even get arrested for having an Australian flag on uh, Australia Day. And obviously, uh, uh, there's other uh, other issues that are that are going on with the the, the Pell. Uh, uh, high court exoneration after he'd gone through the Victorian uh, uh, justice system, but I'm still a proud Victorian. I'll I'll I'll, I'll never leave, and <laughs> I'll, I'll no, still fight for my state. On the Murray just yet, we thought about it. We might have measured it up, uh, worked out some of the costings, but we're not quite ready yet. Look, one point you make. Um, going back a couple of months ago, when all the lockdowns were being discussed, and, and uh, the Prime Minister formed his national cabinet. He had to make a decision about what industries he would close down. Now, there was a lot of pressure on him from the state premiers, the Labor state premiers, to close down the construction industry, which would have closed down all the hardware supplies, hardware retail stores, and all the hardware and construction supply chains. That would have been about an extra million and a half jobs that would have closed down. And a lot of those jobs in the construction industry uh, paid a lot, lot more than the jobs, say in the, um, you know, in the restaurant or cafe industry. You know, so they were, so the job keeper, you know, would have been a much less. You would have to have a million and a half more people on job keeper, and the difference between their wage and the fifteen hundred bucks a fortnight they were getting would have been much, much greater. Also, the uh, the takeaway food sector of the economy. Now, remember, New Zealand that closed down altogether. Yeah. I do a show with a New Zealander and he's told me just how even more draconian their uh, lockdown was. No KFC, no McDonald's. So um, it might be an inconvenience for us, but you imagine, just imagine the effect that we would have had here. And this is what the Prime Minister was under pressure to do. He was under pressure to close down the construction, close down all the takeaway food, close them all down, right? And all the supply chains through them. Now, if he had have done that, we would have had, I reckon, another 3 million people unimportant. The hit to GDP could have been another 10%. And at the end of the day, when you look at our coronavirus numbers and you look at the our infection rates and our death rates per capita, we're almost identical to New Zealand. So there's no reason why there should have been any greater. We're both islands. We both locked ourselves off. You know, you would expect um, you know, if New Zealand had all these much harsher restrictions, you would have expected to have seen that if these restrictions had any actually legitimacy, you would have seen a lower number of infections and a lower number of deaths per capita in New Zealand, and you didn't get that. So that shows that the Prime Minister made exactly the right decision that could have saved this country. I think it was one of the biggest economic decisions or calls that a Prime Minister ever had to make was to say, no, we're going to keep construction going. We're going to keep takeaway food services going against the wishes of those Labor premiers that saved this country tens or twenties or $50 billion plus, right? And that decision, I believe, would have gone the other way if we would have had a Labor government because they would have fallen in line with Labor in New Zealand and the Labor states. We, we have uh, contained the, the virus with, uh, as, uh, 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 less uh, disruption and lockdown as a country such as New Zealand and uh, a lot of the the US uh, states as well and that's and that's certainly something uh, uh, to be proud of where uh, the envy uh, of of the world but we had a lot of things uh, in our advantage obviously closing down the um, you know and it's easy to, it's easy to look at these things in, in hindsight um, there's obviously things that we did that work I think we also had the great advantage of um, being coming out of our summer. We had some very sort of good weather in you know in most of the places there in sort of like late February, early March, and then all the medical uh, you know literature 
on the coronavirus is it basically doesn't like warm temperatures and doesn't like the heat. So that was very much uh, in our favour. Uh, so shutting down the flights from China was also very much uh, in our favour. Uh, the social distancing, we could argue that was very important. But some of the other things, such as like uh, you know, closing up golf courses, look, you know, was there a golf outbreak outbreak of coronavirus? You know, at the Royal Sydney Golf Club, the Royal Sydney Golf Club, anyone reads about? Or was there any case of coronavirus being detected in any golf course around the country? No. Right? Um, you know, the idea that you saw lone paddle boarders being harassed by the police. Yeah, that was in one of our inner suburbs, Elwood. I couldn't believe that. But the, and, and the idea. And also, when you look at some of the uh, the health aspects, a lot of other studies on the coronavirus have said all those that have died had a vitamin D deficiency. So rather than telling people hide at home under the bed, I believe some of the advice should have been, well, you know, yes, if you've got to be home, and yes, you've got to keep social distancing, but make sure you actually get out and you get some sunshine, you get your vitamin D levels up, uh, and you get some exercise and you stay fit and healthy. Because also where these lockdowns have been really, really restricted, such as in Spain and Italy. They've had some of the worst rates of infection per capita of anywhere in the world. I've noticed uh, where I live, uh, plenty of people uh, out exercising, which which is great. And, and certainly myself, I've appreciated when I have gone outside the, the fresh air, it's, I appreciate it uh, even more. I, I'd forgotten that how good it was. Now, most uh, most people uh, they're able to to see uh, uh, your views uh, via your Facebook page. So you were prevented from posting there for a week due to a Facebook uh, bug, uh, which I, I found uh, bizarre. Uh, but you posted this morning about Michael Moore's uh, produced Planet of the Humans uh, Green Energy expose had been removed from YouTube due to four seconds of alleged copyright infringement. Here's a, a, a video or a, a documentary. I think it's an hour, 40 minutes, or an hour, 20 minutes. You're still with us? Yep. Here's a video. Here's a documentary, an hour uh, and 40 minutes, and they found four seconds that someone had a copyright, a most spurious copyright claim over. Um, you know, and based on that, what YouTube have taken it down, like, I think that's, you know... That's a version of, you know, setting fire to the books. You know, you've, you've, there's got to be some substantive issue. or, or subs If you're going to use the copyright excuse, there's got to be some real substantive issue. And four seconds of a uh, of an hour and a half, at least, documentary where there's an exemption for fair use, I think is a, a, a very, very vague, you know, very, very, you know, sort of like, you know, spurious excuse for um for closing that down but then with the the bug that i had on, on my facebook page my facebook page last year someone did an analysis in the uh sydney morning herald papers or, and the age papers and they found out that i was getting more following than the prime minister and uh mr albanese together so i was getting more shares and more likes so um you know so my and when i actually spoke with Facebook, i said oh yes we know your page yet your page is one of the highest viewed pages, uh, you know, political pages in Australia. So it always surprised me, you know, and I was um, at that time quite critical of uh, the lockdown policies uh, that were being implemented not in Australia but around the world. So I thought it was a bit coincidental that there was some bug that they said they and sort of cut me down for about uh, five or six days. But uh, and that's up and running again. And, um, you know, but look, I think there's a couple of issues that we have in in free speech in our society. If you look at the Peter Ridd case, uh, appalling conduct by uh, James Cook University. If, uh, if Peter Ridd uh, is successful or James Cook University is unsuccessful uh, in their appeal, I think the vice chancellor and a whole lot of the board up there have, have no other option but to resign. You know, they're, they're putting at the... They're running this appeal, uh, basically underwritten by taxpayers' dollars. Uh, they are the ones that are besmirching uh, the reputation of that university. Then you go down to 
Queensland University, where you had the, uh, what, you know, I think it was a rather radical left wing young student, you know, and he Andrew wanted to get Pavlov, out. yes. Now, if, he's, if he wants to get out and protest and he's not interfering with others doing their work, right, he should be told to stand there and protest about whatever he wants. That's been the tradition of universities, but, you know, for, for, for decades. And to think that he's been sanctioned by a university because he dared criticise the Chinese communists is just completely contrary to everything universities stand for. And again, the, the vice chancellor of that university should be and I'll, I'll give you one more. Um, the broadcaster Alan Jones is retiring here in Sydney. He's got two more days left on the radio. Now, uh, the Australia Media and Communications Authority, which is a government body, which somehow under the legislation has the ability to go over the entrails of uh, a broadcaster's words and make a qualitative determination on if what he said was accurate or not. Now, they have actually, what, what they actually did, they took Alan's words and they took them completely out of context to give them the opposite meaning of what they were. And I'll, I'll go through it. Alan was basically making the point that biomass, right, which is is not really a renewable energy. So biomass is the burning of wood and um, plant matter for energy. So chop, as the Michael Moore movie shows, chopping down trees and using it for energy is not really a friendly to the environment. It emits more CO2 per unit of energy and it emits more particulate matter. So the idea that you could sort of say you can pump up your renewable numbers by a lot of biomass is basically a fraudulent claim. And that's what Alan was calling out. And Alan's not the only person that's made this claim. And Michael Moore's not the only person that's made this claim in his movies. There's many green groups. In fact, even Greenpeace and I think you know, Friends of the Earth and also have argued against this. But the point Alan was making, he said, fossil fuels and biomass together in New Zealand were 70%. But the way he said it, which is 100% factually correct, but the way he said it was fossil fuels, right, open brackets, that is coal and oil and gas, close brackets, and biomass, right, equals 70%. But because when you're giving the transcript or we're speaking live, you don't say open brackets, close brackets, commas, to put things in context. So we basically had... A whole lot of government bureaucrats in Canberra sitting in some office, being paid by the taxpayer, looking over the words and the transcripts of what uh, someone in the free media has said to try and work out whether the bracket should be here or a comma should be and whether he actually meant that biomass was a fossil fuel. It's just a complete and utter nonsense because they wanted to come up with a headline that said, Alan Jones made misleading statements on climate change when he made no such thing on basically creating a straw man argument. And the whole thing was to try and silence Alan on those points. That's what the whole agenda was about. It wasn't about correcting any factual error because there was no factual error. It was simply about trying to silence free speech. Well, you're absolutely but, right to describe it as a, a kangaroo court, which is what Drew Pavlov is going through with the University of Queensland at the moment. And I'm not sure if you saw this morning uh, that uh, Twitter uh, put the get the facts about mail-in ballots uh, when Donald Trump was uh, uh, tweeting about uh, uh, mail-in uh, ballots. And it leads you to CNN uh, fact checkers who what makes them more authoritative than than the president? I was the ABC fact check. I've got. They, I think I have my own personal division down there, and they did one thing. I did come uh, about two years ago. I made a. Uh, I did a speech at one of the uh, Liberal Party uh, functions here, and someone from Get Up actually snuck or paid the money. Good on them. They they know the main Liberal Party. <laughs> recording under the desk and was simply recording what I said. You know? It was a big coup. Anyhow, they got a trans, and then they went and trans did a, got a transcript of what I said. And they said, oh, I said that the Pacific Islands were sinking, were actually growing in size, not sinking, right? And they said, oh, we've got you. You know, and so they then passed that on to ABC fact check. Yeah, here you go up to Kelly. He's told all these untruths. We've got him on this secret recording. Now, what I said is 100% correct. There's about half a dozen 
peer-reviewed uh, scientific papers that have actually looked at this and measured this and looked at satellite records going back 50, 50 years and have shown that these actual islands are not sinking. They are actually increasing in size. And so ABC fact-check me up. Oh, we've got you, we've got you. So they get you. How can you justify that? So I went back and said, here's, you know, here's the uh, Professor Kent from the uh, University of Auckland. Here's this paper, this paper, this paper. Here's this other professor from France that's done this. And then I said, come on, now you guys have to publish this. You can't do the investigation without publishing it. So I think they published it like on Christmas Eve one day that no one had seen it. And then another case, I did a, um, an interview with that Piers Morgan character over in the UK. And I said, I made the statement that we've had more rainfall across Australia. The first 20 years of last century, we've had more rain than the first 20 years of this century which completely goes in the face of the, the nonsense claim that other oh, countries drying out, we're getting less rain. No, we had more rain, there's been more rain in the last 20 years than there was in the first 20 years of last century. So they fact-checked. So we're doing a fact-check. And they did pages and pages. Of, and their conclusion was that I was uh, uh, misleading or I was wrong. And yet in their own words, they said I was correct. And they basically said exactly what I said. I said, but the headline that they wrote was that, oh, you know, Craig Kelly was wrong saying this. And that's ABC fact check. So you're right. Who makes these people, uh, you know, so like judge, jury, uh, you know, prosecution and executor when they don't have, we're far better to have more, uh, uh, you know, uh, you have free, you better have free speech. And what's the great um, saying from uh, John Stuart Mill? He says, even if you are hearing an idea that is wrong, you are better to hear that because it helps you understand that your view of the world, your idea is actually right because it's been able to defend this. And on the outside case that your idea is wrong and there's right, what have you got to lose? So the idea that we should be shutting down you know, free speech in this country is something where I think really we have to push back hard from and as you said, that Queensland guy, I understand from the far left, it shouldn't just be sort of the conservatives that are pushing back against free speech. It should be against all, um, I say, pushing back to open up free speech. It should be all people across all levels of society. Yeah, we need open uh, debate and discussion of ideas uh, more than ever. And... Uh, uh, obviously, uh, the the media likes to to paint you as an uh, outspoken uh, backbencher. Uh, they haven't used the term maverick uh, uh, MP, uh, but uh, I I have observed that uh, during uh, when the the Morrison government was lobbying for this uh, independent international investigation into the origins of the. Uh, coronavirus, and uh, we've seen China uh, impose tariffs and, and threaten more. The, the the Labor opposition shadow cabinet they did support the the, the motion, uh, but they decided to to, to criticise uh, some of your your colleagues on the on the on the back bench for simply speaking about uh, China's aggressiveness and warning about our trade uh, dependence, and they 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 seem to be. Uh, advocating that, because uh, I think it's a healthy thing for our democracy that MPs are free to reflect their views of their constituents who they're elected to, to represent. Uh, it sounds like critics of yours, they want you to be yes man on the back bench and just uh, parrot the, the talking points. Uh, you should be some sort of part of some sort of super executive when you're a legislator. One thing that, uh, and I'm critical of our party here, the, there's what there's um, what 70 odd 76 of us 76 of us odd in the House of Reps and what 20 odd eighth of us odd. So there's about a hundred plus in the government party room. Now those um, those people in that party in that party room, they've had business experience in all different industries and all different walks of life. So the best way to make sure you get the best policy is if you're a minister you want to bring that policy to that party room and you want to say okay guys tell me the problems with this tell me why this is wrong get out there and argue against me because it doesn't matter how smart you are, are as the minister you've got this brains trust 
in the party room that's been up, I said, every rabbit hole in the country and been involved in every industry. And someone is going to have a perspective about that policy that you haven't thought about or you haven't seen. And that's why it's so important that we, you know, we're not frightened to, uh, you can't all be yes men in politics. You want people to be, uh, you know, dissent and to argue and to take the con contrarian position. Like, I have a sign on my wall here with the girls and, uh, and my office staff. I say, argue with you. Huh? If, if I'm having the discussion how about I'm doing something, if you just say, yes, Craig, yes, Craig, that sounds good, you're no use to me. That's pointless. I want someone to come and say to me, oh, Craig, you know, why don't you use this word instead of that word? Or, you know, have you thought about, look, there's this section of community down in one section of the electorate. They might not like what you're saying. You know, have you considered this? You want people to come. You know, I want people to come and give me alternative opinions and tell me I'm wrong. You know, in the, so that's, that's their, I tell them that's your job in my office to come to me and say, hey, Craig, I think you're doing this wrong. This is, this is um, you know, have you considered this? Have you thought about that? And most of the time I can say, yes, I have. But on not occasion I haven't. But I'd much rather have that input than not have it. Yeah, you, uh, you're well known for uh, your media appearances and you're willing to, to talk to anyone, uh, including coming on, on this show tonight, which I've, I've greatly appreciated. Game, the game that we're in is a contest of ideas. That's part of the political debate. Um, no one's no one has everything right and the only way you're going to get to what is the best policy for the nation is if you have open and vigorous contests of ideas in debates that's what the last you know thousand years of history has, has shown us uh, or two thousand years of history plus has shown us that you want that contest of ideas that's so vital the flush the flush things out and I just, you know, I'm fearful on, you know, fearful in many respects that uh, we don't appreciate that. Look, that's why I think the coronavirus has give us, given us this, uh, a good lesson in this, because it's not just say trust the expert, well, which expert? Because when it comes to the coronavirus, we've got very, a lot of experts that have all different opinions and often completely opposite views. So we should be listening to all those competing views it's our, our job as members of parliament to listen to all those views and try and make up our mind which one we're going to have with the policy. Where you see the global warmest, oh, it's, there's a 98% or 99% consensus and no one's allowed to argue. But that is just such a, uh, such a dangerous, I forget, put the global warming issue aside, but to have that idea spread amongst students and people at university that you have this consent, you always have the consensus opinion, and everyone does. I think is very, uh, you know, dangerous, uh, you know, for innovation and for progress of our society. Uh, hopefully, there there can be this uh, continued uh, reflection, and uh, during the uh, with, with the the coronavirus, and also uh, an opportunity to to fix whether it be the economy or uh, reflect on the state of of free speech and. And debate, and that's that's why I started the the unshackled. It, it, it's in the name. We want. Uh, this is why I do what I do because uh, free speech, uh, debate, uh, open ideas is critical to the future. I agree on you. That's you know, that's uh, exactly right. And but the, you know, the lessons from history show us that. And the idea that there's this uh, one expert that we can never. Uh, you know, question or, or, or look at every, remember every major scientific breakthrough, uh, every major new product that's been developed has been someone going about saying, hey, you know, what everyone thinks is the best way of doing things, I think we can do a little bit better. And you know, when they come up with that thought, maybe 98% of the time they're going to be wrong, but it's that 1% or 2% time that they are right that changes the way people think about, about doing things that has led to almost every single scientific and economic progress that we've had over the last few centuries. Yep. 
to write. I would encourage uh, people to to like your your page on on Facebook. Hopefully, no more bugs because that's where they can see your uh, unfiltered <laughs> opinion. Your your posts uh, uh, are excellent uh, in in detail. And and when does Parliament uh, come back? When will you be back in Canberra? Second week of June. So I've got another. We've got the end of this week and another week, and then I think we're back down in uh, back down in Canberra. There. So I'm looking forward to. To getting back down, and uh, you know, it's a great to be able to stand up, uh, you know, in that Parliament House and uh, to express your views is a is a great privilege. Uh, to you know, I never uh, you know take it uh, for granted, and um, it's a special privilege to do so every time you stand up. I'm looking forward to you know, getting back there. I said one about a fortnight's time. I think also one of the reasons why the the left they they so, so despise you is that you, you always have a smile on your face, and when you're not smiling, you're you're just passionate. You don't come across as as angry. You're clearly passion, and I and I think that grates on them as well. Also, there's the best way to defeat someone in a debate if you can bring in a little bit of humour uh, in the debate, and you can defeat them with a bit of you, you, you you've got them you've got them sort of thing if you consider. Do it in like a way with a smile on your face, and uh, that's why I must, I must, I love the um, political cartoons. Uh, you know, I think the political cartoons are great because they, they're so cutting, and uh, to, to knock your opponent off with a bit of a bit of a joke and a, a smile on your face is uh, uh, so much more a way of, of changing people's opinions on things. Yeah, we need more comedy as well. <laughs> that's what we need as well. Free speech in comedy as well. Well, that's why. Also, remember in the um, our copyright law, we, we have special parody and satire exemptions. So you're able to what, uh, under normal circumstances, could be a breach of copyright <coughs> in your broadcast or what you do and you know, what I do on social media. You know, I guess there's the fair there's the fair use exemption, but if you're doing it with parody or satire, you can pretty much get away with anything. So that's a a very important exemption that we have specifically written in our, our copyright laws, which is sometimes I think people don't use enough of. Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, uh, sat satire and ridicule has, uh, which has been used by uh, one of your uh, 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 state uh, Victorian Liberal MPs, uh, Tim Smith. I think that might have nudged Daniel Andrews to relax the lockdown. Look, uh, I've seen. I've never met Tim. Um, I've seen him interviewed a few times. Uh, very impressive guy. Um, and I think that's what the public wants to see. They want to see, you know, you've got to take the fight up. To, now, when Andrews is doing all these, we look it up here, we, and you say, we just shake our head. You know, what's going on? You know, we joke about Victoria Stan and these stuff. And uh, we're often thinking, where, are the, where is the opposition taking, it, taking the ball right up to him? So it's, it's really been, I think Tim's been a, a, a brasher breath of uh, fresh air. I think he's doing a great job down there. Yep, uh, definitely Daniel Andrews needs uh, more scrutiny. I'll, I'll wrap it up now. Uh, thank you. One, that Belt and Road stuff, you guys down there in Victoria, you've got to be screaming the house down over that. Right? You've got to at least see what this actual contract says. This is like, this is not a joking issue. This thing. He signed you up to some deal with the Chinese communists that you don't know what the detail of what interest rate or what you have to pay down the track. Like that is completely contrary to everything about our Australian democracy. And you've got to be, everything, everyone in Victoria should be screaming their house down and demand, demanding to see the details of what he's actually signed you up to. Well, he is thankfully getting a, a, some more scrutiny uh, on that as well. I, I know that there's a local uh, activist here, Fiona who she started a, a petition to, to have more, more scrutiny uh, on it. So uh, uh, that's uh, thankfully uh, beginning to take place. Okay. Great to be with you, Tim. Thank you so much for your time. Pleasure. Anytime. Thank All you. All the best. Thanks for tuning in to Wilmsfront. Visit timwilms.com or Rational Rise TV to view the archive of episodes. And keep visiting theunshackled.net to view all our shows. And to keep up with the latest real news and analysis.